All right, guys, so we're gonna try something a little bit different and try to make these kind of, these questions kind of a combination of step one and step two. Uh, so I like the fourth question. See if you can do that one. If you can get that one on your own, I'll be really impressed. Uh, but try this a different way and hope you like the video. All right, guys, uh, this question reads, which of the following screening tools would be most appropriate for this encounter? Now, it says a 62-year-old Caucasian male presents to the primary care physician with his daughter due to persistent concerns over long-standing grief after the unexpected loss of his wife one month ago. The family report that their father has experienced intense sadness, poor sleep, poor appetite, and weight loss over the last several weeks. The patient reports that he mainly gets triggered on Sunday morning when they would normally go to church together as a, as a time when he feels most saddened. He reports enjoyment with his children and grandchildren. Okay. So, you know, he, he had a, a significant loss, you know, and there's some, some symptoms that, are, hey, can't sleep, can't eat, all that kind of good stuff. And then, uh, you know, saying that, well, I do enjoy a couple different things. So, really, the question on this one is, is which of the following screening tools, okay? This is how we're going to take a patient from A to Z. Which of the following screening tools would be most appropriate for this encounter, okay? Because remember, the USMLE looks at you as though you're an emergency room doctor or a primary care physician kind of state. So uh, which of these would you use? Uh, the correct answer is going to be, I hope you put, uh, whoops, I should have mentioned them out uh, loud. So I'll do it out loud first just in case you're only listening to the audio. Is it A, PHQ-9? Is it B, GAD-7? Is it C, GAD-12? Is it D, CAGE-8? Uh, or is it E, the TAPS? Okay. Correct answer is going to be A, the PHQ-9, right? Because what are we worried about on this guy? We're worried about this guy. He had a loss, so we're, we're worried about death, right? We're worried about depression and stuff. The PHQ-9, you got to drill that in your head, guys, is depression. Okay, depression. And the last question, the ninth question on that talks about, have you ever had you know, any, any thoughts wanting to arm yourself or any thoughts that life is not worth living and stuff like that? So uh, depression, suicide, PHQ-9, and that would be the most appropriate screening tool for this individual in your office at that time. The GAD-7 is uh, what? It's going to be for, it's more of an anxiety screening primary care kind of level. GAD-12, okay, I just made that one up, guys. Uh, CAG, you know, the CAGE. Okay, the cage is going to be more for alcohol, drugs. Very important screening, but there's no evidence within this setting that that's the best screening for this situation. And then the uh, TAPS, uh, that, is, that is actually a uh, tobacco, alcohol, uh, prescription, uh, medication, and uh, other substance use uh, screening. Okay? So, PHQ-9, GAD-7, CAGE, and TAPS, do they use them? Yes. What's the most appropriate in this situation is going to be the PHQ-9, think depression, and suicide. Okay? So, that was question 104. Number two says, which of the following is the most appropriate diagnosis? Okay, we got normal bereavement, complicated bereavement, separation anxiety disorder, major depressive disorder, bipolar 2 disorder. It says that after reviewing the PHQ-9 screening tool and then discussing the results with the patient, it appears that he has been minimizing how he has been feeling with the family. He breaks down during the interview and reports that he has been having suicidal thoughts due to feelings of worthlessness. He also reports loss of interest in life as well as activities he used to enjoy for the most of the day every day. He mentions being tired all the time despite sleeping 10 to 12 hours a day. He states he didn't want to worry his family as to why he minimized his symptoms. He reports that he wishes he could be with his wife that he loved for over 40 years and finds it difficult to anticipate any, to anticipate being happy again. What is the most appropriate diagnosis? So again, is it A, normal bereavement, B, complicated bereavement, C, separation anxiety disorder, C, uh, major depressive disorder, or, B, or D, bipolar 2 disorder? Now you're going to get a lot of, you know, again, this could be arguable, but based on, you know, uh, when you look at the DSM-5 and uh, what they, how they changed it with the DSM from 4 to 5, I want you to be very, uh, before you ever put bereavement, I don't care if it's normal or uh, especially the complicated, before you put bereavement, I want you to, you know, hands down, you better consider major depressive disorder. Now, the correct answer in this situation is going to be, oh, I got, I got these things all, a little one extra one thing, it's going to be major depressive disorder, Okay. Even though in that first piece he said, oh, you know, I, I find it was only, I, I get triggered on Sundays. But after further review, this guy that he's been having suicidal thoughts, he had feelings of worthlessness, okay, loss of interest, 
that you, things you used to enjoy. Um, and it's for uh, tired all the time. And then it's, and the key on this one too is that he, he didn't like loss of interest in life as well as activities he used to enjoy for most of the day, every day. So it's not just on Sundays like he mentioned before after the screening. It's most of the day, every day. Um, and that he just didn't want to worry his family by saying it that much. Now, is he grieving over the loss of his wife? Yes. But what they found is, it, what, they, what they made a change to it, they said, look, on this complicated bereavement, uh, for the most part, they said they need to study that a little further because they, they didn't feel like, he, I shouldn't I don't put words in their mouth, but they didn't want to like lessen the fact that this guy, someone like, someone like this guy is struggling enough to where he needs to be treated as though it's, it, it is a major depression. It doesn't matter how long a time, per se, because it's because he intends feelings, and he's having thoughts of wanting to harm himself. So the correct answer is going to be major depression, okay? Now, the difference between, say, this, if we just use the word bereavement, okay, the bereavement, the suicidal ideation with the bereavement is ma mainly focused on adjoining uh, the loved one, okay, the lost, the, the person that they lost, whereas if we're looking at depression, okay, uh, it's, it's, it's more of that, you know, this guy says he's feeling worthless, worthlessness, okay? He didn't say, uh, you know, I want to have, I'm having suicidal thoughts because I want to be with her. I'm having suicidal thoughts due to feelings of worthlessness, kind of a difference there, okay? Even though it probably stems from that, he's saying this, okay? Now, uh, you can, you know, you can have feelings, uh, you know, feeling empty, but you also would report better days ahead, you know, that you understand, yes, you know, in a normal bereavement, I'm, I'm feeling down, but I know it's gonna, I know that it's gonna get better. Uh, whereas in depression, you can't anticipate, okay? You really can't anticipate uh, things getting uh, better. And he says that, he finds it difficult to anticipate things getting happy again, so it more supports depression. Uh, and then, you know, if it was more of an, in the bereavement category, you're going to be looking at, yes, uh, I, I get sad on birthdays or, you know, something like that. Uh, you know, some type of anniversary uh, piece. And that's why I kind of mentioned that thing on Sunday to kind of lead you in that direction. But again, after further review, it's more, it's more severe than that. And so this guy's going to qualify for major depressive disorder. And what they, you know, if you're going to go with something like complicated bereavement, uh, you know, I'm not saying this is law by no means, but you're looking at it's something beyond six months. At least that, that's what the original kind of context had. But I'd be very careful, especially in today's day and time, where, where I think even when they're writing these questions for the exam, they're worried about people dying. So, you know, I would always lean. If I'm in doubt, I'm leaning toward major depression so it can be treated uh, to the level that it, that it should be, okay? Uh, and separation anxiety, you know, this is, you know, you're, you're fearing the loss of somebody, but it's but the person is typically you know you're missing the living. Okay, the person's still alive. Okay, you're missing the living. That's separation anxiety, and then uh, bipolar two more of just uh, more of a uh, typically more of a mood swing, not not characteristic of what we're seeing right here. So the answer here going to be major depressive disorder. Now question number three, as we kind of take this patient from A to Z. Family report that, that they can remain with their father um, and for the time being will stay with him. He currently resides in a home by himself with several pets. They report that they can take their father to any appointments that are necessary, including psychotherapy and medication management. The question is, which of the following should be asked to the family during the first encounter before the patient leaving? Is it A, are you open to trialing medications? Is it B, do you feel that psychotherapy is something you are open to? Is it C, what is your understanding of why you are here? Is it D, what is the time, date, year, and something going on, going on in the world today? Or is it E, uh, do you have any access to guns or weapons? Now, I've always asked, um, you know, typically you can ask all these things. Is, there, is it appropriate to say, are you open to trial medications? Sure, you know, they're, they're at that point where maybe that's necessary to that level. Do you feel that psychotherapy is something you're open to? Sure, you're going to at least combine that uh, at the minimum psychotherapy, and maybe you're going to combine that with medications, depending on what you guys choose as a team. Uh, what is your understanding of why you were here? 
you know, you kind of get a feel for that one. I always, you know, I always ask that a lot of times if you see someone in the hospital, like emergency room or from a psychiatric perspective, do you, you know, what's your understanding of actually why you were here? And it gives an idea of whether they're in touch with reality or, you know, uh, et cetera. What is the time, date, and year something going on in the world today? You know, that's more of a dementia kind of screen. You know, this guy is, you know, he's, he's in his 60s, but, you know, I don't, that really wasn't the context of what we're trying to do. Do you have any access to guns or weapons? That is the correct answer. You better be asking that stuff. You, it's all about safety, guys. Even when I see people as a psychiatrist, I even say, look, everything we do, it's all about safety. Uh, I got to make sure that you're safe. That's why I always talk to families uh, for, for, for people. But before you leave, the question that I would go with, do you have any access to guns or weapons? And then the last question for this person, if you get this right, I'm impressed. Okay, very impressed. Uh, but see if you can get it by yourself first. And it says, patient is agreeable to, to trial a medication for, for his depression. He currently takes the following medication regimen prescribed by his normal, uh, or I should say regular primary care doctor who is currently on vacation. They take amlodipine, five milligrams once daily, atorvastatin, 10 milligrams once daily, uh, aspirin, 81 milligrams daily, as well as methylphenidate, 2.5 milligrams for breakfast and lunch. The physician uh, starts the patient on medication for depression. Uh, that would be you, per se. Uh, one week later, the family reports worsening behavior, and their father reports hallucinations. Which of the following medications was most likely prescribed at the last encounter? This is a great question to say, do you know interactions? And I'm telling you, this is where these tests are going. This, sets you, this, this is what sets, sets people apart. Here's what he's taken, okay? They prescribed some medication for depression. You know, one of these, one of these guys, citalopram, sertraline, paroxetine, mirtazapine, or risperdone, and th there was an interaction, okay? What's your answer choice on this? The answer choice is gonna be paroxetine, also known as Paxil, okay? Great question, because what's one of these medications? Methylphenidate, right? For some reason, his primary care, and maybe it's for energy, maybe because he was gonna treat that, uh, it, that's actually Ritalin, okay? Uh, is that Stimulants, okay, I can't stress this enough, guys. Uh, stimulants, they need a certain mechanism, right? What's that mechanism? Do you know? You know, part of me is, you know, part of as I put this down in the comments section, is there is an interaction with stimulants, whether it's Adderall or Ritalin, need to be breaking, broken down by one of those uh, uh, processes in the liver, and I want you to, uh, you know, know that. So that's how it's impacted by paroxetine. And it's hard for me to finish this video without telling you that actually. And the way it does it is with 2D6. Okay. The other, what's the other, and what's the other medication that you got to worry about if someone's on a stimulant and if they start either Paxil or which is the other one that can cause this that are big 2D6 inhibitors. Now, remember when it's inhibitors, that means that the stimulant, you know, normally goes through the liver, right, to get processed. But when you're using Paxil, all of a sudden was introduced. That little highway system going into liver got kind of backed up. So what happens to the amount of stimulant in your system? It increases per se, right? And that's what's causing those hallucinations. I've seen this in the, in the hospital setting actually, uh, but it was mainly with Adderall, but it can still happen with this uh, Ritalin. So what's the other one? Prozac, all right? Prozac or fluoxetine, different name, generic name, can also cause that. These are the culprits, okay? If I'm on an exam and I see one of these choices and there's an issue with medications, I'm going per Paxil or Prozac. Uh, Citalopram Selexa, not as you know, specific to 2D6. Uh, Sertraline or Zoloft, again, not as specific to 2D6. Mirtazapine, not, not that either. And Risperdal is an antipsychotic, not really part of this, or nor is it specific to 2D6 where I'd see that kind of reaction to a stimulant. So, Guys, this is this is the kind of question that you got to be worried about uh, on top of everything else. So, hope you liked the video.